time keeps going on. I mean, you're constantly moving, whether, you've, whether you're standing still or not, time and life continues to go. And so, why shouldn't you? Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to this two-part episode of Theatre All the Moving Parts on the Theatrical Memoir. I host the first half hour speaking with Jesse Green, chief theatre critic of the New York Times, about his collaboration with Mary Rogers on Shy, the bestseller which retells the remarkable and rowdy life of the composer of Once Upon a Mattress. Then Jesse, in turn, interviews the legendary Cheetah Rivera and yours truly, her co-author, on Cheetah, a memoir. What else is there to know about Cheetah after 70 years in the public life? Plenty. Welcome, Jesse, and congratulations on a best-selling book. Well, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> I had a very good co-author. <laughs> I bet you did. And a lot of people just know Mary as the daughter of Richard Rogers and the composer of Once Upon a Mattress. And you may be sure, way down deep, I'm deep They know a lot more now, thanks <laughs> to this book. The subtitle is The Alarmingly Outspoken Memoir. What was the most alarming thing in the book? I guess the biggest one really, and uh, became part of the arc of the book, was to do with her relationship with uh, Stephen Sondheim. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in from the beginning. They met when she was 13. Uh, they met at uh, Oscar Hammerstein's farm uh, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and he played chess with her and beat her immediately <laughs> and then played Oops. Rhapsody in Blue on the piano and she was she was completely sunk with love for him and and the love story obviously an odd one between him and her is is one of the arcs of the book the part that made my jaw drop and that was the most alarmingly outspoken was something I had never heard before which was that she and Sondheim at a certain point between her two marriages had a, what they called a trial marriage, in which she and he tried to live together at least part of the time and sleep together in the most awkward possible way imaginable. That was one of the sort of poignant moments for me in the book, that they sat there frozen, barely touching each other, and if they did touch each other, they, they <laughs> reeled back. And I think that the response to Stephen Sondheim about the whole idea of the book was very unusual. When you went to him and said, look, I'm doing, working with Mary on this memoir, his response was? Who would be interested in Mary, or something to that effect? But there was more to it. I don't know how much uh, ended up in the actual book. And I said, what do you mean, who would be interested in Mary? All of you people are so interesting. And he said, oh, none of us are interesting. What's interesting about me? There's nothing interesting about me, Sondheim said. Yes. And I said, can we start with your mother? <laughs> you know, and he said, nah. I said, and Mary is doing all those things at the same time, but it's a woman doing them. And he said, ah, that's interesting. But that was, the, that was the only thing that he saw interesting about it. The fact that she was a woman at a time when there were very few women composers. Uh, yes, but, and also a woman trying to uh, make a life as a lover, as a, as a person with a family, and, and working and a child of a, you know, the most famous composer in probably in American history. All those things were things that she was uniquely doing and doing as a woman in a time when nobody had that experience as well. The, another potential subtitle would have been The Many Loves of Mary <laughs> Rogers, because we go through a lot of relationships, starting with her father. Um, in what way was that love? really complicated well it was it is the most complicated of all the relationships it's sort of like the er complicated love of the book her father was i would say that if we knew him now we would say he was depressed his whole life mm -hmm. and 
he really was not able to connect to Mary or really anyone intimately uh, with real feeling except through his music. And, and this was the thing that she spent a lot of her life trying to figure out. How did this man, who was so cold and, and in many ways hostile to her, uh, telling her as a child, you know, that she was so fat, she shouldn't smile, her smile was too big, her laugh was too big. What kind of things are those to say to anyone? And then she's at the opening night of Carousel. And that music is pouring out. And it's a story about a father who can't connect to mm. his daughter, in part. So th there was a lot of uh, uh, complication in the relationship, which she did spend her whole life resolving. And interestingly to me, she did forgive him in a way that she was unable to forgive her mother, who was just as bad, but did not have the saving grace of music. And in what way did her relationship with her father affect her relationships with men for the rest of her life? Well, uh, for one thing, she was attracted to genius. Mm -hmm. She was attracted to talent, uh, not just in men, in anybody. That was the thing that, she, that drew her to people socially as well, but particularly in men. Um, if you read the list of uh, people she dates in the book, and as you say, there are many. And a lot of these talented men, obviously, were gay. And she seemed to have a penchant for ending up in bed with gay men. And at one point in the book, it's probably the, one of the most famous lines in the book, is she's about to, thinking <laughs> of marrying Marshall Bear, who is her co-writer on Once Upon a Mattress. She goes to her father, Richard Rogers, and says, I'm thinking of marrying Marshall. And he says... He says, uh, well, why don't you just go all the way and marry Truman Capote? <laughs> Well, what's amazing, too, is that she is attracted to gay men in part because they are marginalized. They're outside the, the mainstream. And the fact that she was raised in this uh, hothouse of social propriety attracted her to rebel particularly uh, against her mother. Yes, the, the, the gay men she knew were just like her. It was ex she had exactly the same story, it just wasn't about sexuality. And of course, Dorothy Rogers was chilly, aloof, uh, and had no mitigating circumstances? Well, to me she did. I mean, of course I didn't know her. Mm -hmm. But as Mary would tell me these stories, I would push back mm -hmm. pretty often, particularly about her mother. I mean, clearly she was some kind of a monster, but not only a monster, if she was, you know, uh, if, if that's all someone is, there's no real reason to think about them or discuss them. She was really talented. She uh, ran a, a business. She invented uh, things and had patents on them. And a jiffy mop. Was a, the jiffy mop, which was ironic because this was a woman who would not get down on the floor <laughs> to play with the kids because it, she would have to send her trousers out to be dry cleaned. But she understood the needs of uh, homemakers. Uh, she famously uh, objected to, uh, when, she, when she was on the uh, New York State Council of the Arts, when they would build buildings and they didn't have ramps for mothers with strollers. She would you know, point out that that could only happen if you had no women on the architectural team. She, she was quite a force in herself, not always for good, but nevertheless, not a negligible person in any way. And, uh, but with Mary... There was, n there was no ultimate forgiveness there because she, she didn't bring the special gift that Mary needed. It's interesting that you said mo the word monster because I think in the book she says, if I had only been bad, I would have been a monster. If I had only been shy, I would have been invisible or I would have disappeared. Um, is she, she's very hard on herself. Is that part of her being hard on herself, do you think? First of all, when we decided to go ahead with writing the book, and that took a number of years because she kept changing her mind, mm. um, she set some ground rules. Uh, or we set them together, really, because you know we both had to feel like we were doing the same work. Uh -huh. And one of them was that she wanted to be get as close to the line of total honesty as she could. Now, as I say in the book, I think she got to w over 95%. And to be 100% honest about 
of a life is a really good bargain. Um, there were a few things that she just couldn't talk about and didn't want to talk about, and I can't either. But even though I can see you want to ask, <laughs> <laughs> but within that, being honest didn't just mean telling the story of dating Hal Prince and he was born grasping a list of people he wanted to meet, uh, whereas she was born with a list of people she wanted to get away from. <laughs> it, it wasn't just those cute and witty things, but real honesty about herself. Mm -hmm. And she, I did not need to push her for that. I, I mean, this is a woman who had been in various kinds of therapy for a hundred years, so uh, she was used to it uh, and uh, quite quickly would move into that mode. What she was able to do in terms of her relationship with her parents is that she was able to put them in, their, in her work in some way. First in Once yeah. Upon a Mattress, yeah. um, which is about uh, somebody with a chilly... An icy queen. Icy queen, <laughs> an ice queen. And then obviously in Freaky Friday, yeah. um, many years later when she, she's a chameleon in that way and able to, how was Freaky Friday in the whole series of books that then became a 2003 movie with Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan and a musical as well. So you're in my body and I'm in your body. I'm old. I beg your pardon. Oh! How was she able to put into that what she had learned all her life? Well, I don't think she knew it when she was writing it. Mm -hmm. um, and she would often say to me when I tried to draw connections between her work and her life, she would say, that's not how creativity works. She said, you just do the job that's in front of you, and this was the job that came up. But that is also not true because, you know, there is such a thing as the unconscious, no matter how many years you spent in therapy exploring it and she hadn't quite gotten to this one yet. This is a story, Freaky Friday, most people know it or have you know, read it in junior high school, uh, a, a, about a, a mother and a daughter who wake up one morning and they've switched bodies. And the whole idea of the book, uh, from Mary's point of view, was to have the mother understand what the daughter's life was like. But the reading experience is to having the daughter understand what the mother's life is like. Both things are happening. And she, it's too, it's too beautifully lined up between her real life and what she wrote to ignore. What lessons did she learn in the way that she was raised that she then applied to her six children, including Adam Gettle, uh, who composed Light in the Piazza uh, and followed in her, his mother and grandfather's footsteps? Well, the, the, uh, you know, basically her premise was to do everything precisely the opposite, mm -hmm. that, which isn't necessarily a good model, um, <laughs> but it was easy to follow. So she was about the most liberal mother you could imagine. Uh, she not only tolerated kids cursing and all that sort of stuff, she taught them the words, to, you know, and she, the idea, no, seriously, she would yeah. teach them words, but she would tell them, this is a word you use at home. This is not a word you use when talking to a policeman, you know, <laughs> and, and really that's quite good parenting, honestly, because uh -huh. they're going to learn the word one way or another better if they already understand, uh, and, and, and about sex as well. I mean, she mm -hmm. made sure that not only that her sons, you know, had condoms and stuff like that, but also understood what a woman would want from a, a man <laughs> <laughs> quite specifically. <laughs> and uh, so she was an amazing mother in that regard, but I think if you were to ask her kids, and I have asked her kids, um, you know, she was also not there all the time. She was trying to do all of these things, and in a way that men have always done, and nobody faults a man for not being home at, you know, f when the kids get home from school, but as a woman, she was expected to do everything she was doing only if it didn't interfere with those other tasks, and it did interfere with those other tasks, and uh, I think her kids all love her and forgive her, but they note that that is the case. One of the contradictions or tensions within the, her life and, and within the book is on the one hand that she is a, what is called, she self-describes herself as a, a bohemian snob. Yes. Or a snob bohemian. Yes. That one of the contradictions within her is that she can be in these Park Avenue living rooms at the same time that she's chairing board meetings at Juilliard High on amphetamines. 
Well, she wasn't high at Juilliard. Now, let's be fair. Uh, she was high at when she was in the Exeter board meetings. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Excuse me. <laughs> yes. Let's be specific I, about I, exactly I, when I, she I was think high. it's important to make that distinction. <laughs> Juilliard was too important to her. Her father had gone there. Uh, when it was called uh, under a different name. But um, yes, she was, you know, and she was also, as she said, an anti-Semitic Jew in a way, and she was an anti-feminist feminist. I mean, she, she didn't have political positions in the way that we think of them today. She actually did the things that you expect a feminist to do. She just didn't buy into the orthodoxy of it or didn't know enough about it until later. And in fact, she made choices in her life that she regretted because they were products of a kind of male-centered way of thinking, such as not working with some of the greatest music theater writers who were women lyricists when she had the opportunity to, like Dorothy Fields. She didn't think that was a good idea for two women. It was, it was hard enough to get something done with just one woman on the creative team, let alone two. So she never did that. That relates back to her blazing honesty, and I think that's what's so captivating about her. I think anybody that reads this book and knows anything about her wants to sit right next to her at any dinner party and learn about how she dealt with the misogyny of her age and how she navigated it. It was a terrible time to be a young woman in a field that was entirely men. And, and among composers, it was entirely men. And she had a chiffonier, a, 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 meta, <laughs> a, a mental chiffonier, in which she put her work in the second drawer and her father's work in the top drawer, Stephen Sondheim's work in the top drawer yeah. as well. Do you think she deserved to be in the top drawer? No. Um, I think she was a very honest and good judge of herself. Now, she, I think she was overcritical, actually, but she might have put herself at the bottom of that second drawer. I, I, I would put her in the middle, but the truth is she didn't have the opportunities to develop that a lot of those others did, and we only know what she might have done by things that didn't get produced. Um, I've heard a lot of the later music that she wrote well after she stopped even bothering with Broadway because it just wasn't working after a couple shows. Um, and it is beautiful. It's reaching out beyond the Rogers uh, inheritance, which she was always eager to toss away anyway. She, any song that someone said sounded like her father, she just tore right up. And reaching toward what I now think of as her son's chromatic sound. And in any case, whatever they were, they were hers, and they're quite beautiful. Oh, me, oh, my heart, here's what I am. I am an art. It's a shame that we don't have shows in which we can hear how those songs work. And that might have been, maybe there would have been a two and a half, a one and a half drawer. I don't know. Well, that's part of the tragedy. The tragedy is what you just said. She didn't have the opportunity, and she wasn't aggressive to create those opportunities, even if she could, which seems unlikely that she could have had those opportunities. Well, look, she didn't have the opportunity, and yet she came from the greatest possible privilege in a certain way. Right. Uh, but that privilege wound up interfering with a lot of, uh, of her opportunity because for a long time people thought her father wrote her music. Uh, to which, you know, they actually said that, you know, he, she couldn't possibly, how could a woman, a young woman, let alone, write this music. And, you know, she would say, why would my father write my music? He doesn't even like my music, <laughs> which was tr somewhat true. Uh, but, you know, she nevertheless had all the connections you could possibly have. When she got out of college, she was there in front of the leading music publishers of the day selling a collection of children's songs. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a lack of privilege in the way we often think of today. But it was a highly constrained privilege. And she was a woman who wanted a real connection with a man, not the kinds of marriages that were offered to her, you know, in her youth. And, and do you think she had that with Henry Gettle? I think she her did. Her second husband. Her second husband, Henry And the father Gettle. of three of the six. And the father of three of the six, two of whom survive. And that, by the way, was one of the other jaw-droppers, but a much more tragic one, which is what 
happened to the Matthew, 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 the eldest of the three children she had with Henry. Yes, whatever else that marriage was, and I only knew it at the end, um, it was loving and warm and filled with, uh, you know, similar taste and great humor. And uh, Paul Rudnick called them, and I think it was an apt phrase, the Nick and Nora Charles of Central Park West. <laughs> because she could occupy that world, that social world. She could. She, she actually never, she didn't go as far away as she might have thought or thought she would from the place she was, the place she came from. You could almost see the apartment she grew up in on the east side from their apartment on the west side. That's, I mean, she traveled a long way to get there, but as in certain famous songs, she wound up pretty much back where she started. Um, getting back to the death of Matthew, it, throughout the book, you get a sense that she said, and I think she actually says it, I don't cry. I don't cry, uh, which is kind of heartbreaking in a way. When she says that, is that a boast? No. First of all, what she says is that she doesn't cry at sad things. She only cries at happy things. And she was quite willing, like, if you told a story about somebody who apologized spontaneously for something they had done wrong, that would make her cry. Or somebody who uh, d did a wonderful thing without being asked. Those, those sorts of things. Uh, joy made her cry. But she was very protected against the, the pain of loss and uh, of um, heartbreak. And those things, she wasn't boasting. She was being truthful. I never saw her cry about any of those things. And as she told the story of uh, Matthew, and it's a devastating story uh, about his death, she slowed down as if to walk really carefully through it without crying and without getting hurt again. Um, and that's the way I knew it was very emotional, but I, not by seeing any tears in her eyes. She hated to, for her hopes to be punctured at one point, so she did a lot of the pre-puncturing. Yes. Even when it came to her son, Adam Gettle, and the Tony Awards. <laughs> oh, that's a... When, when Spamalot was up against Light in the Piazza. Yes. Adam's show. And just before the best musical is announced, Adam turns to her and says, I love you, Mom. And she says, It's going to be spam a lot. <laughs> That's an example of pre-puncturing. Yes. And as was, um, you, but the thing about the pre-puncturing, and it's a really uh, good insight, it, it wasn't necessarily dysfunctional. Now, in that case, it was, you know, she just was, she knew what was going to happen. And she was right, by the way. Oh, yeah, she was. So she didn't want his hopes to be brought too high. He did win. He best. did win best for his score, but the yeah. show did not win. Right. Um, uh, but um, in the Sondheim relationship, she, you know, they tried this bizarre and excruciating experiment, and she had reason to believe it wasn't working. <laughs> and all her friends were telling her, you know, th this isn't working. And she decided n she couldn't wait for Sondheim to let her out of it. She had to do it herself so that, so that she wouldn't be hurt by his doing it. Uh, I'm going to uh, wrap up with Sondheim uh, and Merrily We Roll Along, which is getting its revival, has had its revival off-Broadway, is going to come in the fall. Um, and obviously, it seems to be semi-autobiographical. Uh, Mary of uh, Flynn in the musical is odd that very much based on her. Um, is it not? Well, Sondheim says it wasn't, which means it was. It was. I mean, the, let's just say this: in the in the underlying play that the musical is based on, that character is not named Mary. They changed it to Mary. Right. What do you make of that? She's the uh, funny uh, one who's in love with the composer uh, unrequitedly and has to learn to live without that. I mean, it's just too parallel. Even Mary said, again, that's not how creativity works. But you know what? It's partly how creativity works. Uh, last question. Um, Mary died in 2014, correct? Mm -hmm. um, what would you have liked to tell her about the reception for the book? Oh, well... She, I wouldn't have had to tell her. She would have been ecstatic. I, I wanted to give her a fourth act. She had three amazing acts 
as, as a composer, as a children's book author, uh, books for young people, and then as a sort of doyen of philanthropy, being the chairman of Juilliard and all of that. And, you know, she was so vital and full of love of talent and the ability to spot it beautifully that I felt she really needed to have one more, one more chapter. And that's what, I, that's what I would have liked to have her see, that she got it. Well, it's a phenomenal chapter. I'm sure, I'm not sure that she believes in a heaven <laughs> or, or a hell. I'm sure she doesn't believe in hell. But where, wherever she may be, I'm sure she's smiling down on that. And for that, I thank you for joining us and congratulations again, Jesse. Thank you, Patrick. We are taking a short break. When we return, Jesse and I will be joined by the legendary actress Cheetah Rivera to talk about her new memoir. Welcome back. I'm Jesse Green. I'm now with Cheetah Rivera and Patrick, authors of Cheetah, a memoir which recounts the life and career of the woman who, among many other highlights, created the role of Anita in West Side Story. Welcome, Cheetah. Welcome, you. <laughs> yeah, you. me. <laughs> Patrick. I'm, cho I'm chopped liver. You're chopped liver. <laughs> chopped liver uh, wrote, uh, is the with part of the Cheetah Rivera with Patrick Pacheco, who wrote this wonderful memoir, Cheetah, a memoir. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, and I could not have done it without Patrick. Well, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about two groups of things. One is, mm. uh, you know, the book itself, how you did it, and what surprises you had and all of that kind of thing. And then also, of course, the amazing content, which uh, I, I, is just really a thrill to read and um, to learn things about you and your alter ego oh, oh. that we may never have known. <laughs> but, no, but. you would not have known if Patrick hadn't delved into it. <laughs> well, let's start with that. So. First of all, why, why did you decide to write the book? I gather that you'd been asked many times. I had been. I'd been asked many, many times, and I, I just decided, no, I don't want my private business put out there for the public to... And I live every day like it's the first and the last day of my life, so I... I didn't think that anything extraordinary had happened to me. But then I w was remember re reminded that many exciting things happened to me. How did you discover that, in oh. fact, you had done kind of fascinating and amazing things? And did it change the way you looked at yourself? I was reminded. <laughs> <laughs> I was reminded. Uh, you know, like... Don't you remember doing and and then I suddenly remembered and then you know repeated it um, so that we could get it on paper and uh, and reading it again was an amazing it, it was almost if an out of body experience mm. uh, you know. Um, I was excited again. At first I felt it was somebody else. But then as I read it, I realized it was me. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was me. That's quite a gift in a way, Patrick, that you were able to give to Tina. Oh, Gina absolutely. Um, what, what was your uh, main interest in uh, working on the book and also your main concern on, uh, about what the book should be? Well, it was a gift to me. Uh, to work with her for two years, basically. And, and when it was suggested to me, uh, and this was the first question that I asked Cheetah, I said, Cheetah, after 70 years in the public eye, what is it that people don't know about you? And what did you answer, Cheetah? <laughs> that I'm nowhere near as nice as I appear to be. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, <laughs> let's introduce that woman to the public for the uh, first time. All right, so in the book, that woman is given a different name, uh, also, it, also part of your actual name. Absolutely, it is <laughs> Dolores, which is sadness, Dolores Conchita Figueroa del Rivero. That is my official name. 
want to stucco Florentino talking about <laughs> the fluente is the rest of it. <laughs> but, but, but we'll just go with those four. Well, well, let's just go with two for the moment, the Dolores and the Cheetah. So w was that, was that a double person in you, something you had thought about before? Or was that something that came out as a way to think about writing the book? Oh, no, it wasn't deliberate. Well, it, it, well the, 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 the thing about it is, is that, as Cheetah said, um, you know, she wasn't really ready to spill her, you know, the beans, so right, to speak. Right. And I thought, well, okay, Cheetah, when, and God knows, you know, everybody loves Cheetah and she loves everybody, with exceptions. And when the <laughs> exceptions came up, I said, it's not going to be Cheetah saying it, it's going to be Dolores, right? So that was one way for... Oh, so it was a little, a little uh, uh, hustle you pulled. Uh, it was a hustle. Well, yes, but Dolores was really pushing it. Okay. I mean, she was really at the helm. Um, Dolores is responsible for me having a career. <laughs> yeah. She really is. I mean, she is... She's the honesty, the, the, the power, the... Uh, fire. The fire. <laughs> the fire. Um, the sensuality. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a sexy book. Uh, it, it is, and, and um, <laughs> you apparently were convinced to go into talking about things that you started out not wanting to talk about. We won't, we won't reveal them on the air. But, um, you know, you really do tell a lot more than I think people ever knew about or thought to think about about you because the character of Cheetah is the one we all know. Dolores, I, I had never heard of. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she appears just at the right time. And I was about to do Can Can mm -hmm. with the Radio City Rockheads. And I chose Can Can. Why? After the car accident. Right. I mean, why choose something so complicated? That was Dolores. Something complicated and named for throwing your leg high up in the air. <laughs> I mean, couldn't you and have... And with, the, you... the with the rockets. With the rockets. It's really astounding. I'm fascinated by how you two work together. Uh, did, did you do research and bring it to Cheetah and stir up memories or? Well, it, 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 it felt as though it was only a conversation. It felt as though it was two friends just talking on the phone, getting together and exposing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope Patrick didn't. Um, <laughs> but let's hear your answer. As too. you know, as you well know, there are a hundred boxes of material on Fred Ebb in the Library of the Performing Arts. So, of course, that's a wealth of the materials that wow. I went through every box and could pull out, you know, pull out cards, letters, memos, and oh, everything yeah. like that. So it was always we great. We were very, very, very close, Freddie and I. Your closeness with Fred, uh, we're talking about Fred Ebb, the uh, lyric half of Cantor and Ebb, and a few other people who seem to be shining uh, models and icons in, in your life and career on the stage, particularly Gwen Verdon, mm. um, B. Arthur, which was mm. news to me, um, and Roger Rees. Mm. Uh, <laughs> well, you see, you, you're pulling from me different emotions, and, um, and they are as fresh now as they were when we were having them. Uh, that's how strong my memory is of these, of, of, of these people I've, I've met through m my life. So that must have made it possible, Patrick, for you to draw out the stories because they were all there. Totally, because one of the, there were a couple of reasons why we actually convinced Cheetah to, to <laughs> actually write a book, and that was she wanted to pass on to a new generation uh, of artists what she knew through the years. The discipline that she had achieved you know, through the ballet world before she ever went into the theater. She also wanted to share with them, and in cases, resurrect these people that Absolutely. she had worked with, that she loved, and were as present 
as possible. So that was one of the concepts of the book. One of the things that Cheetah really responded to was, I want to put the reader in the room where it happened with these people. And she totally jumped on that because she wanted to make it immediate and she wanted Absolutely. to pay honor to these people at the same time as exploring their really complicated relationships. Because, you know, putting together a show is often taught and, you know, very uh, fraught with uh, all sorts of personalities clashing together. Well, and you together. see people at their realist in a way. I mean, they're exposed by exhaustion, uh, ambition, tension, and all of those things. And I, I particularly love the portrait of Gwen Verdon because, I mean, you know, we've seen the TV series, we've read about her and, and Bob Fosse, her husband, for a time. But uh, you as a dancer, I think, had a different way of being able to see her. Nowadays, there's men everywhere, jazz everywhere, booze everywhere. Life. And also as someone who was mentored by her in a way, or at least who she gave a, a wonderful support to. Yes, she did. She was the very first person that asked me to come into her dressing room. And it was during um, an audition for her understudy. And uh, this um, was in? Uh, in Can-Can. Can-Can. The original Can-Can. The original Can-Can. And, um, and she said to me, point blank, you really should think about yourself. You should think about exploring yourself. Um, and I looked at her because I was about to imitate her, <laughs> you know. Uh, and and it, 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 was, uh, it was the first time that I had ever thought, ah, oh, there's a me here. That's so interesting. Um, and I'm going to deviate from my plan to talk more about how the book got written. We'll go back to that. Mm -hmm. But because I want to I want to explore that a bit, you know, uh, um, your ballet background, I think we all know that you studied at the School of American Ballet, but uh, how you got there was a new story to me. And particularly, and if you want to tell it, either of you, the story of the uh, kindly Russian man <laughs> who uh, took care of you during your audition. You know, when you walk into Cheetah's house, uh, you know, in <laughs> Westchester, yes, there are awards there, but there's not posters from her shows, at least they're not really visible. What you see are pictures of her family, uh, because it's really dear to her. You see pictures of her friends, and you see pictures of her mentors. And one of the pictures on her mantelpiece is of Mr. Obukov. Obukov. Obukov, a teacher, this <laughs> a Russian killer. teacher. He was a killer. <laughs> that, that smelled of strawberry lifesavers. That's exactly, because he would pop one into his mouth <clears throat> as he came through the door to kill us. But one time he popped one into your mouth, I think. Well, yes. When you did something really, uh, yes. what was it that happened? Uh, he was kind of checking your... Yes, your, I was your... in an attitude, uh -huh. and I was on releve, and to sickle your foot is to go like that. Right. Which proves that you're unsteady <laughs> on your... And uh, I was close to the piano, <laughs> and he went, ah! And he shoved me under into the, pia the piano. <laughs> under the piano. And there I was, lying there on the floor, <laughs> saying, I have just been pushed <laughs> into this piano. And the only, left, the only thing left to do was to get up and get into the... And going back to the reason why I, uh, I wanted to do this book was for, if I could do it, I, I wanted everybody to, to feel as though they could do it. I don't know if that's really true, <laughs> but well, yeah. I would like it to be true. You've got to have luck. You've got to be around. I mean, I was around during the 50 years of Broadway. The golden years. The, yeah. golden, the golden years. So I give Freddie and John and Terrence and 
all of those people, Gwen and Bobby and Jerry and uh, and Stretch and, and Elaine, Stritch and Elaine Elaine, Stritch. I mean, all of I give them all credit. Okay, but I also give Dolores some credit. Um, well, Dolores, I don't fool around with. Okay, but so I, I, but nobody fools around with her. Yeah, let me go back to the uh, to School of American Ballet for a second, uh -huh. because so there's that guy, the one pushing you under the piano, and uh -huh. then you got back up and you did it right, and he gives you a strawberry <laughs> lifesaver. <laughs> And then the the actual Russian I was referring to was during your audition, Mr. Ballantine. Yes, like I, I was so my jaw dropped when I read this scene. I'm not to give it away too much, but you are there, a nervous kid from Washington who has been uh, selected as a potential student. That's right. And Lewis brought Johnson. That's right. Lewis and Johnson. brought from your dance school in Washington to audition at the amazing, hallowed School of American Ballet, and you're doing your audition. And your foot starts to bleed <laughs> through your slipper. That's right. Which is horrible to think about. But you, you, in the book, you don't make anything of that at all. It didn't say well, it just... I was so concerned about pleasing the teacher that I could not feel the pain of the blister that was And bleeding. pleasing the teacher was Doris <clears throat> Jones, who had arranged it all and who was the yeah. second mother. Yeah. Right. And, and so then the person who was watching you during the audition says, come sit here, put your leg up, and he, he bandages That's right. your wound. And that was Balanchine. That's right. <laughs> okay, so first of all, wow. But second of all, we've got, you know, sort of like, you've got the, the, uh, the traditional figure of a choreographer, uh, the one whose name I can't pronounce, um, uh, threw oh, you under Obukov. the piano. Abukov. Right. Mr. Abukov. Okay. And then you have... Uh, Balanchine, who is like tenderly caring for your foot. Now, obviously, Balanchine could also be, uh, you know, dictatorial in his own oh, way. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. But but this does bring us into the uh, the amazing choreographers you worked with, and the time in w in which you worked with them, in which they were the gods. Mm -hmm. And and you say repeatedly. Here, I'm going to read something you actually say, which oh. is. Oh, um, <laughs> they taught us to endure pain without complaint, to do what we were told without excuses. And you also said if someone was selfish, and I think in this case you were referring to either Fosse or Jerry Robbins, I learned to ignore it. But you have to learn. You've got, and what stops the process of your learning? Um, criticizing your teacher. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. How do you criticize a person that knows more, that's older than you, that knows more than you, how do you, how do you criticize them? You don't know as much as they know. The other thing about Cheetah that came through in the book as well is that she didn't really consider herself a star until she was 60. Um, and was in Kiss of the Spider Woman, which of course is a huge chapter in that regard. You've got to learn how not to see what you see. And her dressing room in whatever company she was, uh, was in was always, you know, party central after the show. And the dancers, she always had an open door to some extent, un uh, unless she was praying at her altar or <laughs> altar getting ready for the show. That's true. But the thing, <laughs> the, the thing that would make Dolores come out, you know, like a bat out of hell, is anybody that was selfish, that was into the ensemble for themselves. That's it. And that would just really piss off Dolores. That's exactly right. Well, see, that's the thing I'm pointing to in a way I don't want to say that attitude is gone because it's it's not entirely gone, but it seems to be less prevalent now. Which uh, attitude is that? The attitude of I, I am part of a of an a ensemble. Mm -hmm. I am here mm -hmm. to do the work. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, I don't dwell on any perceived uh, mi uh, mistake that I made for very long or that somebody else made in speaking to me. That's you put it aside, you move on. You keep saying in the book, get on with it. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it seems to be time your, keep, your logo. Time keeps going on. I mean, you're constantly moving. 
whether, you've, whether you're standing still or not, time and life continues to go. And so, why shouldn't you? I, I'm going to take that advice if I can. Um, uh, but I think that that's something that's part of your gift. I don't think everyone has that. And I wonder if it's related to the discipline in your early years. Yeah. Um, or something in your family, uh, the attitudes that were instilled in you by your parents. And you always had on one shoulder? An angel. Uh, and who was that? Catherine? And, and, oh, my mother. My mother was always on my shoulder. And God on the other. And one. God on the other. What was the difference between them? What, 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 was, the, what was the different kind of angeling they did? I was more afraid of my mother. <laughs> Then that you were afraid of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 had, I had met Mother. <laughs> well, uh, yes, I, I, can, I can see that. And, and she knew you very specifically and personally. Oh, yes. God is kind of she busy, was, you know. Oh, slightly, slightly. Yes. Um, let's go back for a minute to some of the uh, process again. Right. So we had a lot of phone conversations. I spent hours and hours there collecting research, and then I'd bring it, you know, to Cheetah. We would discuss it, as she was saying earlier, and it would spark a memory. And then we would put the, together the scene, because to put the reader in the room with it was important as well. So there's a real immediacy to the book. And because it was filled with ghosts, there's a lot of ghosts, uh, that are very alive yeah. as well. And she talks about going to the theater and not only uh, you oh. know sitting in the theater, but feeling all the ghosts that were ever a part of oh, that they theater. they never leave me. Hmm. So they, they are constantly reminders. All the way back, from, from all the way back. Patrick, I wonder if in all the research you were doing, did you sometimes come upon something that you thought, wow, I cannot wait to put this in front of Cheetah and see what it brings back. Well, there was, yes, I, I would suppose, yes. Uh, and uh, the only reason I've never seen is because when I was doing the chapter on The Rink, uh, which was a very difficult show. And by that time, you know, she, the thing about Cheetah is that she doesn't want to disappoint the creators. So the first thing that Cheetah always wants to do is that she wants to make the creative people that she's dealing with, John and Freddie, proud. She wants to be there, the best voice that she could possibly be for them. So when I was discovering just how difficult that was within the circumstances of the rink, I was eager to share that information with Cheetah and how she was able to keep this company together under extremely difficult circumstances because her co-star had problems and, and those problems were permeating the production. Now, many years later, in the visit, there was, she, her co-star was one of the most disciplined, one of the most beautiful souls mm. imaginable, who was also going through problems, certainly not of his own doing. Everything we're talking about his, Roger Reese. Yeah. We're talking about Roger Reese. Had a glioblastoma uh, diagnosed during your previews or, or yeah. at some point yeah. very close Between to the workshop at the w Williamstown, yes. uh, or the tryout at Williamstown, and going to Broadway, there was this devastating diagnosis, and all he wanted to do was make it to opening night. And Cheetah, with the way that she does it, kept that company together with John Doyle, the director, and they said, we're gonna get Roger to opening night. and Rick Ellis as well, and, and Cheetah's assistant, Rosie, Merle, everybody just circled the wagons to get Roger to opening night. So there was a lot of laughter in our conversations, but there was a lot of times when yeah. we just kind of just stopped talking and just absorbed it all because it was so emotional. And, and I can and I see think, even right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, so you're still vibrating to all the things that moved you in the 
Absolutely. at any time in your life still move <clears throat> you now. Absolutely. Well, that's what makes you an actor, in part, don't you think? I mean, that you can, that you instantaneously respond to the stimulus of, of feeling. Um, Latinos do. It's always very close to the uh, surface, yeah, isn't it, yeah, <laughs> Cheetah? Yeah. Well, one of the things that was news to me was uh, that you had a romance with Sammy Davis Jr. and quite a, well, let's say a heated one in, in many ways. Um, it sounded very romantic, but also uh, difficult. Uh, he was a person who was in a difficult place in American society at that time and was not well treated mm. and suffered. Mm -hmm. That's very, very true. But he, he thought of himself as everyone else. But, but the world wouldn't let oh, him no, do that. No, that, no, that, no. That's no, what makes world. that chapter so dramatic. It, it, is, it really is. And the tension in it is you have to figure out whether you can handle that problem, his problem at that time. You were, you were very young. Absolutely. And I had grown very close to his um, father and his stepmother, so it was um, it, it was a, a, a thing to re reckon with. Well, it's a, it's a great chapter to read. Now that you did it, oh. the, the book. <laughs> now that you've done it, and there you are on the front of the book as as Anita in that dress that you so beautifully describe in the book. Yes. That's a dress designed by Irene Sheriff. And, and, and became a famous icon. To, you see, you write in the book that you see it on the street sometimes during the gay pride <laughs> parades and <laughs> things like that. And then you check to make sure they've got it just right. That's right. That's um, right. <laughs> so my question is, my last question is, are you glad you wrote the book? Even yes. though at the beginning you weren't sure. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> ab absolutely, I am reminded of my life, um, and and I'm I'm congratulated, really, um, on on the things that I've done. I mean, uh, Obama. <laughs> you know. Um, You're referring to when you got the Medal of Honor, the yeah. um, presidential, presidential, presidential Medal of Honor. Of Honor. Yeah. Uh, President yeah. Obama presented yes. it. Yeah. I well, mean, I, it is an amazing book. I, I should just let Patrick answer, too. Okay. Are you glad oh. that Cheetah wrote the book <laughs> with you? I am so, so glad. I, truly, it was such a privilege uh, to spend the time, uh, you know, with this woman. And the only thing that I hoped to do was, A, capture her voice and capture the beauty and the diversity and the talent and the sacrifice that sacrifices that she made to have the life that she had and to do honor to her and to the people who helped her all along the way. Well, absolutely. Mission accomplished, I would say. And we're out of time. It's your <laughs> show, but they tell me I have to cut you off. Um, thank you so much. Uh, the book is Cheetah, a Memoir, of course, by Cheetah Rivera and Patrick Pacheco. And thank you so much for spending time with, with, with me today on your show. Well, thank you, thank you for caring. Thank <laughs> you for caring, really. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with artists and thought leaders as New York Theatre, The Fabulous Invalid, regains its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.